Thank you for listening to another episode of Remake Rewind, the podcast where we decide if remakes or reboots should have happened. I'm Mike, as always. With me, I got my good buddy, Alex. What's up, man? It's me. What's going on? Not much. Ready to talk about one of the greatest 80s franchises of all time. Robocop. Cop. It really Cop. peaked with the first movie, though. It did peak with the first movie. There's been four movies, and they peaked with the first one. There's and, a whole bunch there's of good video games. Yeah, and there's like um, comics and stuff too that I know are good, but we're not we're not versed on those just yet. No, not really. It'd be so, so I've I mean RoboCop obviously is a big deal. We covered this like episode five or six of this podcast. We're now on to like episode 120 or close to. Um, so we're totally cool going back. That's obviously you and I haven't talked about it, so I'm excited to go back. Yeah, um, I'm excited I, to talk about I, it. I'm a big fan of this one. I watched this movie pretty much every year and uh but i've never watched the second and third one since i've seen them <laughs> as a teenager middle school teenager i've i've never gone back like i've just heard they're not good and i saw the second and th i saw the second and third ones quite a bit growing up because they would pop up on hbo and showtime and uh back in my day you would just kind of watch whatever was on um, but they would just be on, you know, three or four times a day. And I would just come home from school and just watch HBO for a while. And then week after week, <laughs> it would be the same yeah. movies. It would be, a, it would be a month of like, here's your HBO programming for a month. RoboCop two, you know, fucking Jurassic Park. That's a little bit later, but, uh, yeah, man. So I saw, I saw two and three, I think quite a bit. I've forgotten all of them because they're forgettable movies, but I remember he fought a samurai and I remember he gets a jet pack pre iron man i think i think jetpack is three yeah i think um he, there's like a rival japanese company in the second one no i think that's the third one still because the second one omnicorp makes like an evil evil robot robocop out mm -hmm. of like a drug lord or some shit like that yeah um, you're right see it's all just out of my head it, it's it's the only reason i know that is because i looked it up weeks ago when we decided we were going to do this um the only other thing from RoboCop that I really played or enjoyed was um, there was a RoboCop versus Terminator, or mm -hmm. it could have been Terminator versus RoboCop on Super Nintendo. I yeah, played the I hell out of that game, and I loved it. Um, but this I, movie... I remember having an ED-209 toy, by the way, and I've seen, I saw this movie again you know, a few years ago, um, but it didn't really hit me until recently that it's really like not a kid's movie, and there should not be children's toys made out of it. You, there was a cartoon in like the 90s it is a hyper violent like, like movie. a saturday morning cartoon <laughs> like that like in the same art style as like real ghostbusters like which is another thing that really wasn't a kid's movie i mean it wasn't as bad as this but yeah uh, like the, the yeah, new this is the 20 the kids should be watching the 2014 one has um is more of a kid's movie if you can imagine yeah and uh, there i've got some comments from the director on that one once we get to the the second one um but yeah i'm, I'm ready to talk about this one this one's one of my my favorite go-to 80s action movies it's got one of my favorite lines in all of cinema but yeah i'm ready to go did you want to <laughs> summarize this one or do you want me to do it uh your call uh i'll do this one all right in a crime-ridden, near-future Detroit, Omni Consumer Products, OCP, wins a contract with the city government to uh, privatize the police force. Uh, with the police the verge of a strike, a new transfer, Alex Murphy, is transformed into RoboCop after he is brutally murdered by uh, crime boss Boddicker. Uh, RoboCop becomes more man than machine and brutally takes on crime until memories of Alex Murphy's murder kind of awaken something in RoboCop and he uh, seeks out his partner Lewis to help him take down Boddicker and uh, corrupt OCP executive Dick Jones. That's great. Now, let me, before we even get into this thing, let me just ask you a question. Sure. Are you, or are you, have you ever been down with OCP? No. The correct no, no. answer is, I, yes, yeah, yes. you know me. Yeah, yeah, you know me. <laughs> you blew that joke. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. You want to do it again, and I'll, 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 I was being a dick. I knew exactly what you were trying to do, and I just didn't go with, with Sublime. I'm sorry. No, it's funnier if we break the fourth wall and let people hear this failed joke. Yeah. I, Did you say is, Sublime? Like dick. Yeah, it's Sublime. That is not a Sublime song. Don't they say it in um in doing time? I mean, there's a song that goes, "You down with OPP? Yeah, you know me." Oh, he says, then a, I then I didn't get it from 
the early 90s, uh, late 80s. See, see, there you go. I, I mean, I, then I didn't, I wasn't being a dick. For some reason, I, uh, yeah, you're, I was thinking, you're either a, the, a dick or the, you're ignorant. Time. No, I was ignorant, ignorant in pop in culture. Time. No, I was an ignorant on this one, an ignoramus. <laughs> anyway, this is quite a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that killed our momentum. But let's get into it. <laughs> uh, I love this movie, man. This movie is me so too. much fun. It's fun. It like I I obviously people know who know about this movie know that it's famous for obviously it's over the top gratuitous violence. But it's also like a sharp, witty, satirical film. And it opens with, you know, like a real great kind of satire. It's like, this is Media Break. Give us three minutes and we'll give you the world. And then it immediately goes into like a nuclear bomb, a president going into outer space and they lose power at the space <laughs> station. So the president's floating around in zero gravity. Um, and then it just goes into like crazy consumerism as well with uh, like an ad for uh, like a Yamaha prosthetic heart. Yeah, and <laughs> being um, it, it's just crazy. Being, being uh, not voiceover. What I'm trying, what am I trying to say? The ad is hosted by a doctor. Yeah, and it, it feels like when doctors used to like give their recommendations for cigarettes, kind of thing. Like it's it's pretty crazy. And there's a scene that'll come up later that I never. I mean, I've seen this movie over a dozen times in my lifetime. But there's a there's a scene towards the middle of the movie that I think is even more relevant today. Um, and some of the stuff I just think is like super more relevant today than it was even in the past because like that's what dr oz does like he gets on tv and just like peddles all this like pseudoscience and shit that he shouldn't be peddling as a doctor like it's super unethical and like yeah. here in 1987 you got a doctor doing that there's a corrupt politician in this who demands a recount and even if he loses he wants <laughs> to be reinstated into his position yep. and i'm like holy shit that's yeah this that's relevant the satire in this is just as relevant now as it was in 1987 yeah, I mean, the rampant consumerism is still a thing. Like, that is not something that's gone away. Um, obviously, you know, they're, you know, with Apple products. I want a car blah, with blah, shitty blah, blah. gas mileage. Yeah, the the, <laughs> the, the SUX 6000, the SUX 6000 with yeah. 8 miles per gallon. Look, it's point great. Two. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. 8.2, I'm sorry for that, you know, almost quarter of a mi uh, mile extra <laughs> gallon. Uh, and then, all right, but like, not only does this, you know, set the, the tone for the satire, but it also does throw in, you know, a little bit of the setup for the story. So, you know, it briefly goes over, you know, Omni Consumer Products OCP is bankrolling the police department. The police department is now privatized in Detroit. And then it also briefly introdu introduces us to uh, Clarence Boddicker, um, played by uh, Kurtwood Smith, uh, who's fantastic Red. in this movie, Red Foreman. Uh, and so just like right off the top, like you get a ton of satire and then you get some, you know, little, little bits of exposition in a fun way. Like it's a really unique way. I mean, it's not even unique. Like that's, that's something that's been done a thousand times using a news bulletin to give you exposition, but to mm -hmm. do it in like a comical way is, is fantastic. I, I, it's just this movie from the beginning just sucks you in because it's just so weird and over the top and then we immediately go into, you know, uh, uh, Verhoeven, who, you know, the director, he kind of, kind of has the staple of like, um, co-ed locker room. So like, we're immediately in a co-ed locker room with, you know, naked men, naked women, just 1987, this, you know, very progressive. Yeah. He, I mean, he did this, he did it in this. He also did it in uh, starship troopers. So I think it's kind of uh, funny should, that he has. Yeah. I agree. I think we should, we should mention, um, this movie is directed by Paul Verhoeven, who is fucking incredible and i think an underrated director uh in in hollywood absolutely and you know known for a satire i mean a lot of people it's funny like robocop starship troopers are you know a lot of people's you know favorite movies and you know you can confuse them with just hyper masculine macho nonsense but in reality that's like really not what these movies are about you know uh, a lot of people don't realize that starship troopers is like a super anti-fascist anti-machismo movie and a yeah. lot of people just it goes right over their heads total recall same thing mm -hmm. you know he did that movie as well and, and that it, one's also a very deep philosophical movie and most people just see it as an arnold action film yeah and i think robocop uh similarly is um taking the piss out of masculinity and and machismo um a lot i think it's it's a little bit more subtle in this movie than it is in starship troopers even though that still manages to go over people's heads um but this movie 
we'll get into it with the with the next movie but uh 2014 robocop feels like exactly what 1987 robocop was making fun of those types of movies i agree you know and Sylvester crazy, Stallone like, and arnold he the um Berhoven almost also, passed on this movie he by the he, way he, he also did oh sorry no go ahead what did he also do I was just going to say he also did Showgirls, which I think is another misunderstood uh, masterpiece. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and you mentioned Total people, Recall. Yep. But he, he originally passed on this movie. His wife picked up the script out of the garbage can in his office, and then she read it. And she's like, no, there's a lot of layers and subtext to this. Like, you should absolutely give it, you know, another read. And he did and made this masterpiece. Uh, yeah. So good job, you know, with his wife. We wouldn't have got the same movie um, yeah. if it wasn't for, for her, you know, convincing him to do this movie but you know there's a lot of other things that make this movie great and you know even though like the ed 209 you know there's certain <laughs> scenes like when he's actually interacting with robocop where there's some really quick you know kind of jump what cuts is, and everything what is the ed 209 for the so uh, ed 209 is a uh just this very large two-legged bipedal kind of robot um it almost looks like a uh, like a waffle maker on legs <laughs> <laughs> but it's supposed to be you know uh and we'll get into the plot of this a little bit more detail in just a second but this movie has these like robots that are meant to patrol the street and fight crime that are stop motion and they do a really great job of compositing this in with you know yeah. the live action actors yeah the miniatures and, and stop motion are fantastic yeah it's it's great like it, it there's just something about it even though you know it's not real but it is real. It is real. Thing. Exactly. But seeing, we talked about this with, with Dante's Peak, you know, even though, you know, your brain knows that that's not really happening, seeing a physical manifestation of something, like it, it tricks your mind into thinking something that's fantastical actually works. And yeah, it's much I easier. I think this one really works. Yeah, it's much easier to um, suspend your disbelief when there's an it's, element of something real. It's almost like when they're, you know, for an adult, you know, it's harder for us to fill in the blanks. But like, if you go back to some of the eighties cartoons, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Transformers, uh, uh, Masters of the Universe, the animation is very simple on that. There's not a lot of actual motion in that, but you know, when we're kids, we fill in the gaps with our imagination. Um, and I feel right. like stop motion for adults makes that, you know, just a little easier for us to kind of put ourselves in a world where we can imagine a fantastical element. So, um, really really great effects on this and you know re obviously really great effects with like the blood effects and blowing limbs off and whatnot with the the gratuitous violence <laughs> but uh yeah. uh i guess i'll just go into a little bit more detail on the the uh the plot really quick so the crux of mm -hmm. this movie is uh really this corporation this evil corporation is really trying to one take over the the police force and then slowly they want to take over all aspects of the society in Detroit and build what they call Delta City. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit more in a little bit. And really there's two major players, three if you really want to be specific, but three players at, at Omnicorp or OCP. Um, there's the old man who's the CEO and he just has a few scenes. There's Dick Jones who's kind of the main villain of the movie and he really wants to build up these uh, these ED 209s, the robots he developed. Um, but there's an accident where it just brutally kills another executive when he's kind of showing it off in a, in a board meeting. <laughs> and so then you have, that's one um, of my favorite scenes too. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, and then you have Bob everybody. Morton. Yo, go, yeah, go. Let's yeah, We could talk about the scene a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that's the, that's the, um, the first point in the movie where it is very clear how far they're going to take, um, the dark humor and the satire because, there are people in the boardroom that are, you know, rightfully shocked at what just happened. Like a man is uh, brutally shot to death in the middle of a board meeting on the, you know, 110th floor of the of Amazon, essentially the biggest company in the world. <laughs> but the, th the three or four guys in the room, uh, you know, the, the guys that we're talking about that are in charge, just like do not care about the human life that's been lost yeah. they immediately think like okay a this is bad for business one of the other guys miguel Fer uh, ferrer is like oh this is an opportunity for me to get ahead in this company and the guy whose robot it is dick jones uh who's you know the head of the the creative team that um developed the ed 209 um is just like fuck this is gonna be bad for my career like i'm in damage control oh a guy died who cares yeah and it's just, well then you have the ceo is just like i'm very disappointed just very 
monotone, very yeah. of the fact, matter of fact. Like he doesn't care that somebody actually died. He's just disappointed that yeah, like, he's disappointed that this set his, them. Yeah, he's going to be set back six months on their their timeline for getting um, the robot cops onto the street. He doesn't care about exactly. The guy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that scene is brutal. Like, uh, they give this young executive a gun. And he's like, threaten Ed 209. And he's like, he holds the gun and Ed 209 growls. Like, it's a <laughs> robot that growls. And then it tells him to, like, put the gun down. And he puts the gun down and it and it doesn't disengage. And it just full machine guns him. I think for, for like a solid 30, 40 seconds. Yeah. And what I don't understand is, like, imagine, okay, if it did work. How do you? Do, how does Ed Two Hundred Nine arrest? It doesn't have hands. How does it put somebody in handcuffs? How does it actually apprehend a suspect? Like it seems like Ed Two Hundred Nine can only be used for murder. <laughs> yeah, I think that's very intentional. <laughs> how is it supposed to do uh, anything except shoot the person? Right. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, Bob Morton, um, played by Miguel Ferrer, um, who's uh, one of two people from Twin Peaks that's in this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. He he jumps the gun and is like, "Hey, you know, old man, like we never hear the guy's name, but he's just like, I've got the RoboCop program. Let's uh, give me a shot, give me a go, and we'll we'll make we'll make a human cop robot hybrid kind of thing." Um, and then like the the secondary plot, but it's also the primary plot depending on the way you look at it. But Alex Murphy just transfers into a new district in 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 uh, Detroit. His first day on the job with his his uh, partner Lewis, he goes and stops a robbery from uh, Clarence Boddicker, and it's just brutally murdered. Like his his partner gets distracted by one of the henchmen is like peeing off a ledge, and she goes to arrest him. And he's like, "Hey, like you're under arrest." And he's like, "Well, let me zip this up first. And he Lewis, just the like, worst cop in the world. Yeah, and she just stares at him and then like looks down at his dick, and he just laughs and like clocks her, and she like falls, you know, off a two story building. Uh, survives, but because she fell off a building, she's like not able to answer uh, Alex Murphy's call. And Alex Murphy just gets, you know, his arm blown off and then his leg blown off and then shot in the head point blank and is recruited to be Robert Cop, which is one of my favorite. I don't know if you've Robert ever seen Cop. that on the Robert Cop. Have you ever seen <laughs> no. the Chinese knockoff toys? No, we were talking about, um, we, were, we were calling him uh, Robat Man. <laughs> <Bro> Batman. <laughs> yeah, because this is more for 2014, but 2014 is basically just Batman, but he's a robot. So yeah, he became Ro Batman. Yeah, but I, I I always call him Robert Cop. Anytime I'm going to watch this movie, I'm like, I'm going to watch Robert Cop. You want to watch it? Because she's <laughs> never seen it. Um, but no, there's a look it up. There's like, a, you know how like there's always like Chinese knockoffs of, you know, like superhero toys. Sure. Um, it, Robert Cop is the Robocop one. It's pretty Love it. great. Love it. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the the main aspects of the movie. Throughout the movie, je different people recognize RoboCop as Alex Murphy. At one point, Lewis sees him in a hallway, and she's like, "You kind of look like Alex Murphy," and he's just like, "What?" <laughs> um, and then, like the one of um, Boddicker's henchmen, uh, at one point, he when he's going to make the arrest at the beginning of the movie, he's like, "Dead or alive, you're coming with me." And then as RoboCop, he encounters him again, and it's like, "Dead or alive, you're coming with me." And the guy's like, "Oh shit, dude, I know you. I killed you." And then Robert Robert Cop figures out that he's part human and starts to remember his life and essentially goes and solves his his own murder and takes on Boddicker. And uh, meanwhile, Boddicker's also working with Dick Jones. Dick Jones hires him to kill um, Norton. And that's where one of my favorite lines comes in. There's a scene where Norton, because he just, you know, R RoboCop is super successful. He just got promoted to being like VP of the company. And he's got some hookers and blow. And Boddicker comes to kill him. And he just walks in a matter of factly. He's just like, bitches, bitches out. Oh, yeah. Bitches leave. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just one of my favorite lines in cinema. It's just, it's, yeah, it's terrible. Fantastic. Like it's not, are... it's not an okay thing to say, but it's just. No, but it's perfect for that character. It, it's, it's perfect like for this character effective. and perfect for the movie. And yeah, it's just. There are it, so it, many good one-liners in this movie. Yeah. Oh my um, God. It's so good. I'd buy that for a dollar. Dead or alive. I'd you're coming it. with me. Yeah. Uh, oh, bitches leave. I, bitches leave. I also just like it's and the like the violence in What's, this um, movie. What does he say when he shoots the guy in the dick? Your move, creep. Yeah, your move, creep. And he like so he does this thing where like this rapist is gonna like cut the pubic hair off of a woman and Robocop shows up. So the guy puts a knife to the woman's neck and he like scans and he realizes like, oh, based off the height, like he can shoot the guy's dick through the woman's <laughs> skirt between her legs, and he just blows a man's dick off. Incredible. Well, I mean, he didn't blow a man's dick off. He shot a man's dick off. I want to be clear. He didn't do oral sex to a criminal. I, yeah. Um, 
Oh, there's another one. He says, uh, excuse me, I have to go. Somewhere there is crime happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I also like uh, he's on TV after doing an arrest and they're like, what do you have to say for the kids? Stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> I would love a- I don't. Th- I don't uh, think we're we're qualified to talk about it, or uh, I, I I haven't read up on it enough. But I would love to get one of our um, our friends that are knowledgeable about queer cinema to come on and talk about uh, the the coding and subtext in this movie because I feel like there's a lot there. I think there probably probably is. We should we should talk to to BJ and see if she has anything to say. BJ, text us. Yep. Uh, one of the I mean, Clarence Boddicker is also a fantastic character. Like he's just evil like at the beginning of the movie he sacrifices one of his own men to like they're slow let, down the police they're letting their friend their dead friends like lay around left and right yeah that happens well, I mean, like three a, times in the movie where they just yeah, abandon well, like, one of their comrades there's there's a point where like they, they rob a bank or something and one of the guys like burns some of the money blowing up the safe and Boddicker's like you burn the fucking money and then like he sees the cops coming so he just kicks the door open and they're in this yeah. like big van and they kick the double doors and it's like bobby can and you then, fly, Bobby? And then <laughs> throws him out the window, and it just hits the cop car. It's fantastic. Yeah, oh, and that's such so that's good. such a good character moment too, because it's like, oh, that guy's serious. He's scary. He doesn't give a fuck. No. Well, and then a little bit later, um, Alex Murphy, uh, before he's Robert Cop, uh, busts into their hideout, uh, hide hideout, hideout, and um, <laughs> ends up killing one of the guys. And then that this is the scene where they they destroy Alex Murphy. They just blow him away. Or shoot him away, I think you said. And uh, they leave their friend that he killed back there. They ne- they never even like referenced that he killed one of their one of their crew. No, not uh, at all. And I think it happens again later on in the movie too. No, yeah, no, it it happens several times. There's a point where at the end of the movie, when they kind of do the when him and where RoboCop and Lewis go to take on Boddicker on his like home base, um, Emil who. Uh, he's the one who recognized him. This is one of my favorite uh, parts kind of, of the movie, by the way. Yeah, he he's like he gets hit and like goes into he crashes this car into this like toxic waste Hell and he yeah. comes out and just looking like this monster like you know worse than a toxic avenger <laughs> and like his friend uh ray wise the second guy from from uh twin peaks in this movie mm-hmm. uh is just like and terrible he's like stay away from me stay away from me <laughs> don't touch me <laughs> don't touch me and then like the the um <laughs> Boddicker ends up hitting this guy and he splatters into just like a water balloon of gore and then he flips his own car and like almost dies. It's just an got, insane scene. That scene was really funny to me also because you get so like it's the 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 the, the premise of the movie is that they turned a, ro- a cop into a robot, into a cyborg, right? So like already this is a fantastic movie, you know? Um but I got used to it and up until that moment and then this guy does the classic superhero move where he gets uh, thrown into a vat of toxic waste and emerges, you know, transformed into a mutant. And um, I was like, oh, right. This is like an a, absurd movie where ridiculous things happen. Like, this is a fantasy. Yeah, it's, it's I, crazy. It's It feels so ridiculous in that moment, even though we already have a cyborg cop. So, I mean, I don't think we need to really break this down too much more. At the end of the movie, we get that iconic scene where, you know, he he busts into OCP and he's like, I'm going to arrest you, Dick Jones. And Dick Jones is like, you can't. I fucking work for OCP and your program won't allow it. Because of the secret directive. Right. And so then then the old man's like, you're fired, Dick Jones. And Robocop shoots him. And then you get this, like, scene that's like. It's it's made fun of. Like this is like one of the few things where the effects really don't hold up. Like the weird, really long armed man flailing as he's falling. <laughs> I don't understand what that is or how that happened, but uh that didn't bother me that much. It it's comical, but I mean that's the end of the movie, and then the guy's like, What's your name, son? And he's like, Murphy. And so the obviously the implication is that Robocop now knows that he's Alex Murphy and yeah. you know, where's the line between man and machine at that point? You know, obviously that's one of the big themes, but he's got um, an arc. Yeah, exactly. But one, you know, we I kind of wanted to go back to the the satire a little bit because one of well, the other before, things before you do, I just want to point out people keep on dying in this boardroom. Yeah, and I, well, I would and maybe not have meetings in there anymore. Is that so? The Morton uh, has like kind of a, a friend who's an executive who um, is with him almost every time. There's a point where like they go to the bathroom and Morton's like, "Dick Jones is a pussy," and you know, I, he's the old man. I'm the new guy. I'm gonna go and like. 
Dick Jones is literally taking a shit in the executive bathroom when he walks in, talking. And he shit never about washes his fucking hands. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Well, and so then, like everybody realizes he's talking shit about Dick Jones. Well, Dick Jones is in there, so everybody runs, including his friend, who mid piss like z- whips his dick back in and pisses his pants. He he's that his afraid. Dick. <laughs> he unwhips his dick mid piss and pisses his pants. <laughs> <laughs> because he's that afraid of Dick Jones and like Dick Jones was taking a shit and he's just like I understand you're the young bull and you think you're gonna uh, you know unseat me I used to call the uh, the old man names I even called him an asshole once but I was never disrespectful and then he, he says like to wipes him, his hand he's, <laughs> yeah. he his hands through his hair and his face and he just shit like he didn't wash his hands he just rubbed his mm-hmm. shit hands all over his face he also tells him uh, you know, I called I called the old man an asshole, but there are some lines I knew not to cross. You just murdered somebody in your workplace. <laughs> what line didn't you cross? I know, right? You, you're working with a mass murderer, drug kingpin to you know overthrow the city. Come on, dude. Oh, uh, man. what a great movie! Yeah. So to, to get to some of the satire, you know, one of the other things, um, and this was I don't know if this was originally intentional. Like, obviously. Um, 1987, you know, the crime in U.S. was rampant or perceived to be rampant, which obviously led. This is why this movie is still relevant, because obviously one of the big things with uh, the last election in 2020 was Biden was one of the authors of the big crime bill that has led to mass incarceration, which is directly in response to the violence in the 80s. So this movie is still relevant because obviously the crime bill that happened because of the violence was brought up with the election last year. Um, But there was a scene where uh the first time that robocop as robocop meets Boddicker, he's like stopping a uh, Boddicker from taking over a, a rival's drug operation and while he's like reading the miranda rights he's like beating the shit out of Boddicker and like throws him through several like windows and the director wanted to <laughs> you know they wanted to cut the scene because they're like oh you know people aren't going to like that uh, and test audiences loved it they loved seeing you know just a horrendous villain getting the shit beat out of them so then they were like oh cops aren't gonna like this because you know they're beating a witness and it turns out like they did like surveys and that was like cops number one scene in this movie Woof. was the part where they like abuse somebody while reading the miranda right so it's just like Woof. that's obviously very relevant to all the shit that was going on last year too like it's just incredible how relevant this movie is 40 years later yeah. Yes, I it's agree. Just, oh my god! It's so it's just it, I, like I, it's incredible. Every time I watch it, you know, I notice something more. And then I already brought up, you know, the the, the uh, city councilman who lost his election and held everybody hostage <laughs> and wants a recount and he wants to win no matter what kind of thing. Even if he loses, he's gonna he wants his job back. So it's it's just pretty crazy. And then uh, the consumerism throughout. There's all these commercials. There's all these crazy board games. And just like the desensitize, um, people being desensitized to violence, you know, there's a, like a mock battleship kind of game, but it's called Nukem and (laughs) it's, it's just a fantastic movie. Fantastic. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, why are you even listening to this? Go, go watch it. Yeah. Go, go watch it. The only thing that I can kind of critique on this movie is it brings up and, and like this is in the the subsequent movies, but like this movie was considered a risk at the time. They didn't think it was going to make money. You know, it it cost about $8 million. It made 53 million, you know, back then that's a very, uh, I'm sorry. It was a $13 million budget made 53 million. So, you know, this was a, a moderate success back in the day, but there was never a point where this was guaranteed to get a sequel. And one of the big plots is that Omnicorp is going to basically take over all aspects of Detroit and that never that that plot is never resolved like at the end of the movie you kind of forget about it because the ceo is just like dick jones you're fired and so you you almost forget that the ceo of the company is a bad guy too and wants to take over the city yeah it feels like the last uh 30 minutes of this movie were a little rushed um yeah i i noticed uh the third act is mostly like um pacing wise is like pretty pretty quick like there's a, there's a good uh you know momentum to it but leading up to the third act there was like 20 minutes or so um where i i felt the movie slowing down quite a bit um that includes a scene where uh all the cops try to shoot robocop to death although i thought it was funny that uh i, I thought i i just imagined alex murphy in the robocop you know uh outfit being like no not again <laughs> shot to death so many times in this fucking movie man yeah. Uh, but I, I felt the movie slow down a little bit there. Um, 
and then it kind of picks up for the for the last um, the last confrontation with Boniker. Um, and then the boardroom scene is like fun, but feels a little tacked on. And yeah, you like you kind of lose the the perspective of like, oh, this this guy runs this awful corporation, but now I, he's kind of helping out the the good guy. I no joke couldn't remember like when I was you know doing our show notes for this, and you know everyone was like Omnicorp's an evil corporation. I'm like, why is Omnicorp evil? Isn't it just Dick Jones? And I'm like, oh wait a second, no, they wanted to do this plot. <laughs> like you kind of forget about that plot because yeah. there's this big hurrah as everybody cheers the death of Dick Jones. To the new movie's credit, I think they leaned into that evil corporation thing. Oh, absolutely. So the only other, you know, kind of trivia I want to bring up on this before we we move into our next segment is that uh, this movie was actually responsible for the apprehension of a a robbery suspect in in Sacramento, California. Um, (laughs) A a thief ran into a movie theater that was playing this and and tried to hide and got so engrossed in the movie that he didn't even notice the cops evacuating the civilians and then like next thing you know he looks around and there's just the cops and him in a movie and they arrested him so (laughs) that's awesome Uh, i have a piece of trivia yeah go for it the robo the robocop suit was so hot and heavy that peter weller lost three pounds a day from Ah, uh, gross yeah and eventually uh installed an air conditioner into the suit yeah like that suit costs anywhere depending on the version anywhere from 500 to a thousand to a million dollars by the end of the movie that's (laughs) That's insane The budget of this movie was $13 million, so it's, you know, the most expensive aspect of this movie was the suit. That feels like a bit of the the satire, too. Like, that suit is so impractical and ridiculous, like, in, you know, well, in the world of the movie. He was too he's, big he's not and bulky. Agile. Yeah, yeah. He's, like, he's, like, not agile at all, right? He can't even fit in his car. Yeah, so that's why every you never see, like, when he's in the car, it's only ever just him wearing, like, the headpiece and the chest piece. Yeah. And you, you never see him in the car full body. You always see him getting out or getting in. But yeah. they always just kind of film. That's, yeah, it's just. It's like totally like said, impractical, impractical, but it, it, you know, it looks cool and he's like shooting a bunch of people and shit. And I think that's kind of a comment on these types of movies. Like, you know, what else can we do, man? He's big and made of metal. That's fucking cool. We're going to do it no matter how little sense it makes. Yeah. Cool. Um. So I think this next segment, what have you been up to, bud? We're probably going to have to just shotgun it a bit. Because yeah. I know my list is really long because I, I didn't read anywhere near all the stuff I watched when uh, we had Jade on our last episode. If you guys haven't listened to that episode yet, we did have Jade um, from AFI and uh, Black Audio on to talk about the thing. It was a great episode, so go back and listen to that if you if you haven't already. But uh, And if you're a new listener that uh, came over from that episode, thanks for sticking with us. We yeah, hope you thanks. continue to. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we got a – oh, we got a new uh, patron. I got to give a shout-out to our patron. All right, so uh, we got a brand new patron this month. Uh, Raised uh, joined our patron list. Uh, he's giving us a dollar a day. Uh, I just assumed a gender. I'm just going to say Raised. They gave us a dollar um, for uh, Patreon. And they uh, they went through and listened. They mentioned that they liked a lot of our other content. So thank you for thank supporting you so the much. show. And thanks for uh, listening to more than just the AFI episode. So, that is awesome. Uh, awesome. Um, but what have, what have you been up to, bud? Um, did we talk about Bo Burnham inside when we had Jay? I haven't watched it yet. Katrina oh, had like night shoots like all last week. And it so is she so a lot. fucking good, dude. I've been listening it to the looks album. Incredible. I can't wait to actually watch it. It's basically like, uh, like a video album. Like it's a bunch of music and, uh, they just released all the songs on Apple music. So I've been listening to that all week. That's so tight. Yeah. I need um, to watch that still. I'm ready for Spiral now. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I've watched Jigsaw, the 2017 um, series capper to the Saw series, and I was surprisingly into it. It was really good. I heard that I mean, one it's, it's, like, came it's back not really around. Good. It was better, like closer to the first yeah. three. Right, right. I think, and it's the best looking out of all of them. I, I thought it was cool that Tobin Bell got to uh, really look good in one of these movies. The yeah. other movies are like very 90s and very cheap. This right. one had an actual budget and shit. Um, I'll blast through the rest of these. Mitchell versus the Machines was great. Uh, the Pulp I've King heard that's really good. Jack Black. Uh, Mitchell's, yeah, it was good. Um, the Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Uh, one and a half stars out of five. <laughs> uh, the Last Boy Scout, which is incredible. It's another. That's been on my uh, list. Tony Scott, hero of the '80s and early '90s um, action that's, movies. That's along with that's Portland. um. Um, Bruce Willis Bruce, and one of the Waynes brothers, right? Damon, Damon Waynes. Waynes. Yeah, yeah, man, that movie is so much fun. Um, very, it feels a lot like uh, 
true romance in a lot of ways because obviously tony scott um i mean i i tony scott has directed many fantastic movies oh of Uh, course election which i haven't watched in, in a few years uh so that was fun to revisit fantastic uh real steel which i believe was on your recommendation right i don't think so it's good. I like the movie. I don't I feel remember. Like I feel like you've it talked you. about. I feel like you've talked about how much you like Real Steel. I haven't seen that movie since it came out, so I definitely haven't talked about it. But it's it's okay. a good movie. Who told me about Real Steel? I don't know, man. But anyway, it, it's, I, I, it's a good movie. Yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I wish that they had uh, they had made another one. Well, we're getting Rock'em Sock'em Robots with uh, Vin Diesel. So yeah, that is a slap in my face. <laughs> me personally. And then uh, a bunch else? of. T- no, a bunch of TV that I did not write down. So, <laughs> got know. it. I'm I'm gonna shotgun some of these I watched and just didn't talk about last time. So, um, I started that Warrior show. That's on. It's a Cinemax show. Oh yeah, but it's on HBO Max. Didn't like it. I watched is... the first three episodes and like it's all the action is at night and it's super dark. It's really hard to make out. And you know, I just I really wanted to like it because Joe Taslim's in it. And you know, I watched yeah, I was the gonna Raid say recently, Mortal, Mortal Kombat. 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 And, uh, like, it's just, I, I personally didn't like it. This show is just, um, it's like that one episode of, uh, um, I almost said Lord of the Rings, but it's not Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, where, like, nobody could see anything because it was so dark. <laughs> Every episode is like that. It is so dark. I turned up the brightness on my TV just for that show, and I could still barely make shit out. So, I wanted to like it, and but I just, I couldn't get past three episodes. So, eh. Uh, I watched Ocean's 8. It's a fun movie. Yeah. I really like it. I think yeah. it's just as good as Ocean's Eleven and Ocean's Thirteen. Surprisingly Ocean's good. Uh, based off your recommendation, I watched Greenland, and oh my god, it's a fun movie. <laughs> it is ridiculous, over the top. Gerard it's also Butler. Very sad. It's very sad, and like every bad thing that happens to like Gerard Butler's family is like their fault for like waving it in everybody's faces that they were selected to survive, and they made themselves targets. But it's it's a very good movie. It's very intense. Like it just starts. Like five minutes, you know, not even five minutes in the movie, he finds out they've been selected to survive, but like survive what? He doesn't know. And then he finds like they're having a barbecue. And then there's an announcement that like, hey, there's a meteorite coming. Hey, Gerard Butler, you, you get to survive. And all of his neighbors and friends are like, what the fuck? Um, and it just kind of <laughs> goes, but it's a great movie. Um, yeah, it doesn't really let up. No, it doesn't. Like it just puts its foot on the gas and never, never hits the brake. Um, like I mentioned, Katrina was working. Um, she was doing a... Uh, uh, she was working on a film and was doing night shoots um, the last couple of weekends. So I had a lot of time to myself. So I watched all three of the Nolan Batman movies on the same day, back to back. Oh, yeah. back. And uh, they're great. I mean, even even The Dark Knight Rises, you know, is definitely not as good as the, the first two, but it is still a fantastic film. Uh, I watched Street Fighter. I watched Step Brothers. Uh, I watched Dunkirk. I finally got it. That's like the one Christopher Nolan movie I never got around to like watching. It? It's very good. Like it's it's. I think it's probably my least favorite of his movies, uh, just because I don't feel like it did really anything unique. But it's you know it's a beautiful film. It's well shot. I, uh, I mean, if you didn't enjoy it that much, you didn't enjoy it that much. But well, I, I uh, did enjoy it. Like I, I think still, the, I think I still gave way it a four and a half or five. The on timeline Letterboxd. is super unique, though. I think the, the way they played with the timeline is more unique than Tenet, honestly. Um, I mean, I don't feel like the timeline was that unique. I just felt like it was just three different stories. Like they were pretty concurrent like it was very yeah, good they, i just didn't i, I think it's I, interesting I don't like war movies all that much i think we glorify war way too much in this country and i'm just kind of over it sure but it was I don't, still i'm not good movie that's cool no, you're, you're a warmonger i get it dude it's so hard to communicate when we can't see each other <laughs> <laughs> uh no i i just, i i had a i haven't revisited it so i, I don't want to like die on this hill but i thought it was really interesting that there were three stories that we're watching concurrently that take place over different amounts of time. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And that that's like, I mean, maybe that's like self-indulgent or whatever, but I think that's more interesting than time goes backwards sometimes. Yeah. No, it's a good, I didn't feel like it was that unique. It just felt like it was a, a one big event with three different characters and you were just checking in on characters. Like I, I didn't think it was that crazy. What I did think was impressive was how little dialogue is in the movie. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more Talk. like just that sense of, of unease and just peril. Um, it's a very good movie, but you know, if I were going to go back and watch any other Nolan film, it's probably, that one's probably the lowest on my list to go back to. I so. just like having Tom Hardy in a mask doing eye shit. And yeah, another voice, <laughs> but no, it was yeah, a good movie. Um, and then, um, just to shotgun the last few, um, 
the Orange Years, the the Nickelodeon documentary on Hulu. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah, I saw you like great, that. Great mix of nostalgia and just like background details. Like I had no idea how old Nickelodeon actually was and how progressive it was. Like it had, I think it was only around for about a year before they fired the first like CEO and then brought in a woman to be the head. And then they had like women as like all the creatives, like very, very progressive company. And just, I learned a lot about that company and then also just got like my nostalgia kind of bur- like buzz. Like it was really good. And then, um, while I was at the gym, I don't know why I kept with it. It wasn't good, but it was just like easy to watch and not really have to think about. But that Shadow and Bone show on Netflix, um, just mm. watched that while I was on was doing my cardio the last week, and it, it's it was very predictable. Like Ben Barnes is in it, so I knew he was going to be the bad guy because he's the bad guy in everything. Sure. And yeah, and then Dave came back. I, I highly recommended Dave. Um, it came back last Wednesday and had um, or Thursday, and it had two episodes dropped the first day. And uh, I love the show. You should watch it if you haven't. Me and personally or our listeners? Everybody. Everybody should watch Dave. <laughs> it is so fucking good. It's hilarious. And it has like, you know, there's very deeply flawed characters. But then there's also um, just this this idea that like it's okay for a man to like love their friends, like actually love them. And then this, uh, there's a one character who's bipolar. And like everyone just accepts this person unconditionally. And it's just it's a... The character's super immature and he's kind of a dick, but like there's just something endearing about him. And I, I like a little little Dickie's music. So great show. Check it out. Watch it. Cool. It's got the mic stamp of approval. <laughs> Word. All right. 20, 2017 or no, 2014 Robocop. Uh, tell tell quick, me about it. Well, quickly before we jump into that, there's one thing I did want to say about um not even about Robocop eighty seven, but about Peter Weller, who plays Alex Murphy. Uh, he's also in a little movie called Screamers. Have you seen that? Screamers, the um, that's that's uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson, right? No, that's it's, no, no. It's um, not Peter Jackson. I no, I'm thinking of a different it. movie. I'm thinking Frighteners. I'm thinking Frighteners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. No, Screamers is about um, like is like way in the future, and it's about these uh, two like mining companies that are at war with each other on a distant planet, and they've developed um, technology that basically puts um, uh, a table saw inside of like a little uh, piece of AI, a little critter like the size of a, a rat or something or a hedgehog, and it can it goes through the ground and. Um, and can detect enemy combatants and jumps up at oh, them weird. and kills them. And that technology has developed to the, it, it, uh, the AI like started becoming self-aware. So now both, um, of these mining factions are stuck on opposite sides of the planet. Neither one of them can go out into the battlefield lest they be attacked by the other ones screamers. And it's just like, that's a fucking cool movie, man. I recommend the other people, movie people that, that, since we're bringing up these movies, big. um, Leviathan, with him is also really interesting like they're in like a submarine and then they like find this uh like they're like a salvage crew or something it's been a long time since i've watched it but then they like find this um this flask but like and they start drinking it but like it has like some mutagen and like they turn into like monsters or some shit let's do a Um, patreon episode where i watch leviathan or and you watch screamers we both watch both of them (laughs) just yeah just a little peter peter weller yeah, our next our next uh, Patreon episode um, will be out next week, and it's going to be on Fast Nine. But that is a good one to oh, yeah. uh, to have in our, our our back pocket for another one. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, twenty fourteen Robo Robot Person police Robert Officer cop. cop Batman Cop Robot Cop. Robert. Uh, In 2028, war will largely be fought by drones and robots. The United States is the lone holdout in regard to allowing robots to take the form of police officers. Omnicorp believes a cyborg is the loophole they need to sway public opinion and make billions of of dollars off a robotic police force. This is a tongue twister. When police officer Alex Murphy is critically wounded, Omnicorp (laughs) tricks his wife Clara into allowing them to turn Murphy into Robo Robert Cop. Robert Cop Batman. RoboCop single-handedly reduces crime by 80%, but only by overriding Murphy's humanity with programming and hormones. They lower his dopamine to uh, non-existent levels, so he's basically a drone. Uh, Murphy is somehow able to override his programming and begins to solve his own murder. Afraid of Murphy uncovering what they did to him, Omnicorp attempts to destroy their own creation. Yep. That's what happens in this movie. 
So I'm just going to say this right off the top, and I feel kind of bad. We, I did reach out to Joel Kinnaman on Twitter to see if, you know, hope against hope we could try to get him on. Um, now, do you ha- – uh, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you. Do you have the voicemail that Joel Kinnaman left you where he's just using horrible – uh, racial slurs and <laughs> calling you every, every awful name under the sun. No, I, I deleted that. I cats. didn't want to do him dirty because I'm sure he listened to the old episode and I wasn't kind. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bash him, but I'm also not going to be kind. Uh, I didn't find much of a difference between his Alex Murphy and his, his uh, zombified hormoned, overly programmed version. Like he was very dry in this movie. I think this movie could have done, a lot better with a more charismatic lead. And I'm not saying he's not a good actor. Um, I think he's fantastic in other other things. Like, I think he's incredible in, in House of Cards in the season that he's in. Um, mm-hmm. But he is not charismatic in this movie. He's very flat, very boring, and I just was not endeared to him at all. Well, let me let me hop on my boy Kinnaman's side because I watched um, the one that I forgot in my uh, What Are You Up To, bud, is For All Mankind. I binged both seasons of that show, and it is so good. I've heard um, it's good. That's on my list. I I'm really, going to start that this I, week. And I enjoyed him in it, and I'm looking forward to uh, The Suicide Squad, the one Suicide Squad, mov- squad movie that exists by James Gunn. Oh, that looks um, so good. I can't wait for that one. I'm very excited for that. I think that uh, Kinnaman got done dirty by... Not, I, don't, I don't even know if I want to say the script of this movie. I feel like it didn't know what it wanted to be. And I don't even think it's the director's fault. This feels like a movie that was noted to death. Um, That's 100% true. So the, And you know the, what? The, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a hot take here. I mostly enjoyed this movie. I don't think it's I, that bad. I don't think I it deserves didn't... all the hate that it got. I don't, I just think, don't, it's I don't think that it I don't think that it needs to be a Robocop movie. I think if this movie came out and it was not called Robert Cop. Actually, let me let me rephrase. I think if this movie came out and it was called Robert, the cop who was turned into a robot, but is not affiliated with the 1987 movie Robocop at all, it would be a better movie. I think I, that there's some good ideas in here. And they brought the same staff back. So like Edward uh, Newmeyer and Michael Miner, who wrote the original one, came back for this. So a lot of the original. I think staff. Verhoeven was the uh, w- staff. I think uh, that's that's evidence that Verhoeven was the driving force behind making this uh, making that a satire. I I think so because the the thing is uh, so the director Joshua uh, no not Joshua that's the other writer um, uh, Jose Badija he was uh, he did you know Narcos and a few other you know Brazilian movies um, this was like his first like big big movie and he said that this was like the worst experience of his life for every 10 ideas that he came up with Sony mm-hmm. shot it down yeah no surprise. And, yeah he said this was absolutely the worst thing he ever did and he thought it should have been rated R and because Sony you just cannot kneecapped him. This- this movie cost a hundred million dollars and you cannot get that kind of money involved and do anything re- you know remotely controversial like right. robocop 87 um does not get made today with a hundred million dollar budget i mean it just depends on the direct you have to have the right you're definitely not with a new director not with a a big studio like this like in this i mean even this time even run, like even seasoned directors you know who what directors um have that type of sensibility and could pull that off like we just talked about james gunn maybe but he's still he's making four quadrant movies he's really good at it yeah i think he's getting to the point where he'll be able to do whatever he wants um obviously if christopher nolan really wanted to go go ham on something like this he could probably get he it. gets that tarantino. kind of money because he doesn't do that right tarantino could um they're, 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 you're right. There, there are very yeah. few directors who could, and I don't disagree. And originally, this was supposed to be like a, a sixty million dollar movie, and it, it ballooned. Uh, so Sony yeah. got really scared, and apparently, like executives from Sony were on set like every day, making sure well, that the director didn't overstep. Part of the re- guarantee it's PG thirteen. Yeah, and, and but yeah, making it PG thirteen is ridiculous. Like, again, just don't call it a RoboCop movie. Make it about something else. There's enough meat on the story bones with. Uh, Joel Kinnaman or with uh, Alex Murphy, the same same character, um, you know, losing his humanity that wasn't explored as um, as on the surface in the original RoboCop that I thought that that was interesting. It could have just 
been its own thing. It was, you know, different and enough. I, from I agree with you in that. Like there's certain things in this one that I think are, are really interesting. And like in the RoboCop 87, um, and I, I purposely didn't bring it up until I can talk about it with this one. There's a scene in, in the 87 one where they're like putting him together and there's a point they're like, Oh, his arms intact. And, and Morton's like, nah, get rid of it. Like they, they really mm-hmm. want him to be like all robot. And in this version, they initially want him to be, more or less human in a robotic body until they figure out that like he's still not as effective as a robot so then they you know manipulate him um but i liked that you know we got to know him as alex murphy a little bit i just thought alex murphy was kind of boring and then he you know even as a robot we saw that he's like he thought it was almost like a frankenstein kind of thing where he's Mm -hmm. like i'm a monster kill me i hate this and then he's that was one of the more effective uh yeah i agree this movie too when they take away all the robot parts and he's just like a sack of lungs and a heart which i don't understand why you would keep the lungs and the one hand like the one hand was a nod to the them saying should we get rid of it in the previous movie um but i honestly don't (laughs) see the point of why you would keep the lungs which is an incredibly vulnerable part of the body um but you know that that's just me being practical but um, I, just to, I agree to circle with you. back though, yeah, and just, just to cir- circle back to the budget, um, I'm not surprised that the budget of this thing uh, w- that it went way over budget because it's got um, Gary Oldman, Michael Keaton, uh, Jackie Earl Haley, who's uh, hot at this point, um, Sam Jackson, Michael K. Williams, Jay Baruchel, Sam Jackson, Sam fucking Jackson in a role that like doesn't need to exist in the movie, frankly, and He's, also doesn't well, I mean, need to be played by Sam Jack. He, he was Bill O'Reilly essentially. Yeah, but like the this um, the satire, the element of satire that's coming from the TV shows in this movie is not as um, important or interesting as it is in RoboCop eighty seven. Yeah, it's and it's then on top of that, on top of that, face. they get someone like uh, as recognizable as Sam Jack to to do it. And it's just like, well, okay, why are we? And the first ten minutes of the movie is just Sam Jack doing um, uh, a newscast, you know, with the with the people in Tehran. Yeah. Yeah. It's essentially him just being Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity kind of thing. Like the satire, like any satire in this movie is all on the surface. Like there's no thinking or having to decode what they're trying to, to say about this yeah. one. Like it is very obvious. Like we're, oh, you know, here's the conservative news outlet and they're bad. Um, yeah. Which I don't disagree all... with, but it's, no, but it's, it... it's all on the surface. There's nothing to really think or ponder. Yeah, and I feel like it's also kind of spread thin because we spend so much time with Sam Jack and like doing this critique of, uh, you know, Fox News, essentially. Um, And then there's also um, what we mentioned earlier, where they lean into the the evil corporation thing, where like uh, Michael Keaton is basically Jeff Bezos, you know, in 15 years, Um, (laughs) which I think is like is interesting. I like that they were doing that. But when you're spreading all of this um, cultural critique around, it loses its... uh, it, it dulls the the impact and it dulls the the edge of it bringing up michael keaton like i actually did like a lot of the things they were doing with with ocp in this or on, they could just call it omnicorp in this one um i, I kind of used omnicorp loosely in the last one even though they called it ocp um but i also like that there's like they put like robocop through focus groups like they you know it wasn't just alex mm-hmm. murphy they, they considered all these different people and gary oldman like turned him down because he you know is he has a heart and he has a soul and he didn't want to be part of this program, but he's trying to get his his robotic prosthesis program funded. So he begrudgingly helps develop RoboCop. Um, but then there's a point but, where Jay Baruchel is like the marketing guy and they do like they have all these different like versions of the costume or the suit, you know, like, oh, this one transforms and has lights and this one is the nightmare mode and it scares people. <laughs> like, I really liked that idea of the 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 marketing behind this, that this is a product that they're trying to sell and this is the prototype and we're going to come out with different designs and everything. I thought that was a really cool thing and I just didn't think it did enough on that. Yeah. Again, if they were spending less time with, uh, with Sam Jack being Bill O'Reilly, which is interesting, but like, uh, not terribly fascinating and spend a little bit more time with, um, you know, marketing a product and like how soulless that process becomes. And I think that would have stayed relevant too, because, uh, you know, there's no way for them to know this in 2014, but in the last seven years, uh, that's become a part of everyone's life. Everyone's trying to like brand themselves on Instagram and stuff. We're all doing, or anyone that's you know uh, creative and trying to trying to do a thing on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. They're all constantly thinking about you know how they can do this within themselves, and it's like not healthy. And yeah. you know this movie had an opportunity to explore that, 
And like I said, it's, I think Sony fucking noted it to death. I'm sure that um, Jose Padilla had some uh, some interesting ideas for that. No, absolutely. I do, I do want to say that I like that they gave uh, Michael Keaton um, uh, uh, permission to, to kind of go crazy in this. I really like yeah. uh, well, Crazy Keaton. Ver Verhoeven commented on this. He watched this and the 2012 Total Recall and was both like, this was just studio hack job. Like it didn't do anything like, and, and yeah. I do agree. Like I, when I watched this a few years ago, so this is the third time I've watched this movie. I watched it in theaters. Um, and I remember ta telling one of my really good friends who's a big Robocop fan. Uh, he was like, should I go and watch it? And I'm like, not really. If you've seen the trailer, like if you go back and watch the trailer for this movie, you've seen the movie. There's nothing that you can't piece together from the trailer in this movie. So I, I told him, I'm like, you saw the trailer, you saw this movie. And I thought that was the case with the total recall movie as well. But like, yeah, this is, this movie just to me didn't, it had some unique ideas and it took some swings, but I just don't think anything connected in the right way. Like, I think this could have been think, trimmed a little bit. Like the dirty cop yeah. element could have been removed. That, and it could have just been OCP interacting with shit and trying like i think it would have made more sense to have ocp be the one behind the crime boss trying to stir up crime so that way they can justify putting robots on the street and streamlining it and getting rid of the 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 crooked cops um like i think there's a lot of things they could have done i think they could have leaned in more on what if what if uh, alex murphy getting overwhelmed by being a robot you know but if he shut himself down and became more robotic because he's overwhelmed by all the information he's getting like i think there's so many different interesting things they could have done that they've touched on in this movie that they just didn't quite reach the full potential on any of these ideas i think there's just too many ideas that's trying to juggle and didn't deliver one of them yeah. well yeah i agree i think if uh you cut out all of the um the inflated um salaries of the the a-list stars in this movie and just replaced them with like good character actors and got the budget of this thing down to like 10 or 15 million um, well, i don't i don't think you like, can ever get it that low but i mean if they kept it at well, the 50 me, 60 million i think they could have had something i was saying if you get the budget of this thing down to like 10 or 15 or even like way below that and like really cut back on the action but find an interesting way um to, to shoot it or allude to it off camera or whatever and just make it a movie about a guy losing his humanity to you know fucking amazon um trying to turn him into a a, a product as a way to you know make some money by getting through a loophole in uh with, with their buddies in congress i think that's interesting i think that could have done well even on like the uh the independent film circuit you know as just yeah, like a low budget sci-fi yeah it's almost like the transcendence movie with johnny depp like both of these movies kind of touched on that same thing. Like there, there's a good idea in both of those movies, but neither one of them quite delivered. And like visually, like I, I don't want to just bash this movie because there are certain things. Like I obviously talked about some of these ideas are good. I just don't think they landed. But visually, there's some really interesting shots in this movie. Um, yeah, I agree. There were quite a few really long, you know, 10, 15, 20 second um, cuts. Um, there was this one shot that I thought was incredible when he, when he first wakes up and he realizes, you know, what's happened to him. Um, and he, you know, kind of busts out and he starts running through the hall. There's this part where he like runs into this like clean room and like the steam's going and it's just kind of this like over the shoulder, you just see his shoulder in his head. And it's just like him barreling through this hallway. And it was just almost like a monster, you know, running through a lab. Like it was really effective and cool. Like there were some really cool shots and like it's just a shame that you know there wasn't one of, more one of my together. favorite yeah one of my um favorite shots one of the ones that stuck out to me was when he finally goes and sees his kid after he's been turned into robocop and there's like um like a long two shot like uh, uh wes anderson you know very like side side framing um where he goes up to his kid and the kid is sitting down and he's fully in the shot but robert cop walks into the frame and his head is cut off and it's just like very jarring and like unnatural um, for him to be standing out of frame while this kid is in frame looking up at him. Yeah. And they, they, they hang on it for like five or 10 seconds. And then he finally kneels down into frame. And uh, I was like, oh man, that's like uh, a more interesting visual than. Uh, I agree. Than Cause that, in, in that moment, else. he's, he's still juggling trying to be human in this new body that mm -hmm. he's not used to. Like it's a very effect. Yeah. Like they do a lot of like really good camera and shots setting up that. And 
And he's also like a stranger to his kid kind of, or he's worried about being one. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's also just like a, a jarring moment. You didn't know which way it was going to go. And um, having like an uncomfortable shot like that and sitting in it, I think uh, uh, enhances that. I, I 100% agree with you. I think I, did, I I think that was a very effective scene. And I think it's just, you know, a few of the highlights. And, and I just think overall, um, I, I think a few, you know, people who did the heavy lifting, I, I think... I think Gary Oldman kind of phoned it in on this. I don't think he gave his best performance, but I think you know Jackie Early Haley was Gary, probably Gary, to me was the, sh the shining star of this movie. I thought he was the did the most with what he had. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's funny. I kind of feel the same way about Jackie Early Haley. I feel like Gary Oldman phoning it in is still pretty good, and I feel like Jackie Earl Haley is just like not gonna be. Um, a smarmy piece of shit that you kind of love to hate. Yeah. I but, think both of those I mean, guys are just doing the thing that they do. But I feel like everything I see him in, he does something different every time. Like he's not, you know, you know, people might know him as Rorschach or Freddy Krueger um, or this. And obviously he's the, he was the kid in bad news bears as well. Um, All pieces but, of shit that you love to hate. Yeah. But I, there's just something about, I'm not, I'm not diminishing Jackie yeah. Haley at all. And same thing with I, Joel Kinnaman. I don't think like, I don't know that Joel Kinnaman has a I think ton those of range. I think yeah, he's I kind of always doing the same thing, but I like him and he's charismatic. And I think he still like manages to, I, I think all I of think, these, I think all of these guys still manage to like wring emotion out of moments. I think Jackie so I really Haley 100% elevated John Kinnaman. I didn't, I think John Kinnaman was much more Joel. animated. Or See, John, this is why he didn't yeah. want to be on our, yeah. in our <laughs> podcast. You don't even know his name. <laughs> Joel Kinnaman um, was, I feel. John Kinnaman. <laughs> Joel, <laughs> Joel Kinnaman was much more animated when he was in the scenes where he was interacting with the antagonistic um, Maddox played by by uh, Jackie Early Haley. So I, I, I feel like he elevated other people's performances and like he got, you know, the he got the laugh like when after that big scene, which honestly this the way they tested Robocop, I, I'm, I'm curious how, how you feel about this, but the big crux of the, the movie was. They wanted to have uh, robots policing the streets, but because of the Dreyfus Act, they couldn't. And so they found this as the loophole. Um, and so they ran it through a scenario and he ran, he did the scenario perfectly. So it was just like a robot doing the scenario and him doing the scenario. But he ended up being about 5.2 seconds slower because at a key junction when there was a bad guy holding a hostage, he's like, hey, stop holding the hostage like he gave the hostage a chance to or the the criminal a chance to give up and when the criminal didn't give up he shot him where the robot just immediately shot him and to me I, I didn't see that as a failure he didn't take any damage he still killed all the you know all the the other villains who got in the way and the hostage wasn't killed and it was only a few second difference uh i didn't under i'm like dude that's a win he was super effective nothing bad happened to him blah 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 um but the company was like, that's not enough. So then they basically turned, they rewrote his brain to listen to the software when battle's going and release his chemicals to make him think he made the decisions, even though he didn't. Um, so that was one thing I didn't really get almost dude. this is still like, he's still way better than a regular cop. And then the other test was he had to go against like 40 robots that have the same programming as him and Jackie early Haley. Um, and if he got shot by Jackie early Haley, he loses and dies essentially. Um, I didn't understand how that's a fair test to have him go against 50, you know, ish identical versions of himself. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not super fair. Yeah, <laughs> I, think like, just, not a, I think they're, I think they're trying to test him, um, as hard as they can to make sure that he's absolutely, you know, the best version of the product that they're trying to create. Right, and I th and I think the the first scenario that you mentioned is another interesting thing that this uh, movie doesn't really explore, because the what they don't um, what they're talking about, but they don't actually say, and they don't end up exploring, is okay. This Robert, the, Robert, this robot cop, this robot does it faster than uh, than Joel Kinnaman, than Alex Murphy does, but Alex Murphy has uh, you know humanity and. Um, is able to to give the the criminal an opportunity or whatever. There's you know a hundred different ways that that can go, but he's got the human element, and the company sees that as a, a bug, not a feature. Right. And I think that you know, ultimately, but that was the whole point of putting a human in the robot, though. 
and ultimately a lot of uh, the communities that these robot cops or uh, cyborg cops are going to be in probably want some human element in there. Um, and the company doesn't give a shit about that. You yeah. know, they, only, they only care about their interests and the max amount of control that they can have. And I feel like that's you know part of the movie, but it's not really explored as much as, Absolutely. It, as it could be. So, I mean, other than that, I don't really have, have any anything to talk to talk about if you've seen i, I honestly say if you haven't watched this i thought movie, there was a couple i thought there was a couple weird choices with um nods to the original so like his uh his partner instead of being nancy allen this young young white woman it's omar from the michael wire k, it's michael k williams omar from the wire it's like slightly older uh black dude and i thought it was also interesting named Lewis. To, yeah r- right and i thought it was interesting to uh to to race swap um the gender swap feels a little like, well, you're taking a role away from like a woman who could be doing an homage to this like kind of badass character, um, as badass as you know '80s movies let uh, women be. Right. Um, so that felt like kind of a bummer. And then they also uh, they uh, gender swapped the um, the chief of police, kept her kept her black. Um, but then like made her the bad guy, which I thought was weird. Like yeah. in the original, in 87, um, the chief of police, like doesn't really have uh, an impact on the story one way or the other, but he's like, you know, kind of a badass. He's a hundred percent on the side he, of the cops. I mean, listen, even though he's a, he's a cop and this show does not support cops. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's a man of the people as far as that movie's universe is concerned. And in this one, the chief of police is like corrupt and a piece of shit, which, you know, a cab, like, yeah, yeah, for sure. But in the world of the movie that, I don't know, that was kind of a letdown. I did like that. They Obviously had I'm Lewis. very conflicted about it. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you on that. I, I do like, that I, thought they had it, Lewis. I think it did the movie a disservice. That's what I'm saying. I, I agree with you on that hundred percent. I do like that. They had Lewis or, or Omar from the wire save him multiple times. Uh, yeah. so, you know, he, he crashes a truck into a, an Ed 209. Uh, he also like shoots Jackie early Haley as he's about to kill him. So, you know, RoboCop definitely needs, de- needs more help in this version. Um, yeah, it's but he's more a, human uh, in this version. Kind so. of a Captain America, uh, Thunder, Thunder. What's the guy's name in Falcon Winter Soldier? Thunderstar or something? Battlestar. Battlestar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Michael K. Williams, Lewis has a weird line in this movie. Can you help me out with this? Was it the one where he's like, when he shows up for the first time as RoboCop in the new suit, and he's like, at least you're the right color now? Yeah. What the yeah. fuck does that mean? He means he's black now. Okay. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know, man. I Like, Lewis thinks it's cool that, like, RoboCop is a black dude? Yeah, Even I, think, I think that's what it's supposed he's, to be. Because he's painted black at that, at that point. Yeah, and let's talk about the suit really quick. So, like, the prototype suit when he's, like, in China and doing his, uh, uh, the experiments before the final test is, you know, a very obvious homage to the original because it's silver. Um, mm-hmm. Then there is a, you know, the nightmare mode um, that Jay Baruchel is pitching during the marketing meeting is actually the design from the 87 movie. Um, yeah. But then he goes to the black kind of thing and it's like oh let's make it more urban more tactical and i feel like a darker gray gunmetal would actually blend in into like a cityscape more than a pure black um yeah i i agree i also think that that scene came 20 minutes too late into the film i agree and then at the very end of the movie you know he's almost he he's almost killed um he gets up on the roof and it has a similar um ending to the original one where it's like oh he realizes he can't take on an omnicorp person and this is a red asset people they have like an rfid bracelet um but he's just able to you know there's no like dick jones moment where you're fired and he's able to kill him it's just like he just overrides it he's just like oh you're threatening my family yeah it's and i guess that's more supposed to be like oh the humanity outweighs the machine but like there's no commentary on it yeah kind of anticlimactic yeah and then he gets a new suit at the end which is basically the prototype suit again it's like silver again yeah Eh. I also thought it was kind of funny that uh, we're talking about similarities to Batman and you watched the, uh, the Nolan movies this week. uh, And there's that iconic line from um, dark Knight, uh, or no, from Batman begins, right. When he gets the tumbler and he goes, does it come in black? black. Yeah. And that's basically the same like beat that they did in this movie. Let's make it black. Exactly the same. And, and it was being delivered by Michael Keaton, who was Batman. Oh shit. Funny. Yeah, and then like this movie ends with. The and by clash. the way, they, they also thought... painted his little uh, robot bed black at the same time. I thought yeah. that was cute. Um, awesome. And then this movie ends with the clash. I fought the law, and the law won. Yeah, that kind of sucked. Yeah, like just Sony, 
and and this is you know obviously why you know a lot of people when sony said they were going to pull spider-man after far from home um far from home uh was the first sony movie ever to gross a billion dollars and they're like are you guys fucking idiots like you guys made the robocop reboot and total recall and they were yeah. garbage like why are you gonna pull you know yourself out sony, from marvel sony is maybe not great at making movies yeah and it's just like yeah this was not a it's uh, like you said it was just noted as a death i think if we just let the director do his thing or if they found a way to bring uh verhoven back like this could have been a badass like they had the original writers like man if they got yeah. verhoven back like i think this could have been really interesting or even bring verhoven on as producer and let him have a say on who directs it yeah let him pick i agree like it, or just, I, just yeah let, let him have a say in what's going on yeah but uh i mean i can't i, I understand why they wanted a reboot like, you know, obviously, especially sure. in this era. And I, I mean, I honestly, I think it's a little, I mean, it's been seven years. I, I wouldn't mind seeing a re reboot of RoboCop. Actually, what I think if I were to be, if I was in charge of the IP, I almost think like the best thing you can do with RoboCop would make like an open world Detroit game where like you're slowly piecing together um, clues from, you know, a, a, a case that you were trying to close as Alex Murphy and you know you're slowly becoming you know more human or something like that but i think like an open world robocop game could be pretty cool and i like the character i just i don't know if we need another movie or if we should get a tv show or or what um i if they i wouldn't mind another movie if uh verhoven was probably involved i don't, I don't really know what he's up to these days but i think the most important thing is that the studio uh, just gives the fucking keys to uh a young hungry uh, director with a voice that we never hear from. I think like, you know, Ryan Coogler taking over Creed and uh, Black Panther. You know, we need somebody with like... You know, Jordan Peele could be an interesting. They're... Yeah, we need, I mean, you know, somebody has an opinion on what's going on with yeah. uh, cop violence right now to do like a fresh take on it. Yeah, I agree. Like, I'm really interested to see what happens with the last season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine because they said they're going to address everything that's been going on. But uh yeah, I, did you I, notice that the the bad guy Valen looks like Underworld David Spade? No, I didn't notice that. I mean, I can see oh. now. Pick, thinking back, you know, I can see why you'd say that, but I I didn't I didn't. I was very distracted. That. Yeah, but I mean, he was just like a not like he didn't really add anything to it. Like the only thing I almost no, feel like to that totally uninteresting that subplot. Like I once again, I think they should have had the corporation been behind the, the crime ring to, you know, try to increase crime so they can get robots in there. Um, I think that would have been a better take on it. But then, you know, there was this line that I liked once again, Jay Baruchel, where he's just like, when they realize that Alex Murphy's taking over again and he's like, Oh shit, he's solving his own murder. Why didn't I think of that? And so it's like, there's that marketing thing. Like I just, there were so many like little nuggets that were so close to being something and they just never really came to fruition. And yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, I'm repeating myself. I'm, I'm done. I, I, I can't say I recommend watching this movie. I mean, maybe if you're, you know, at a party and you have a bunch of people, but it's definitely not something you have to watch and pay attention to. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't, you know, I think if you go into it with very low expectations or it's on in the background, it's just fine. Or if you have a morbid curiosity, uh, but it's not a must watch. No, not by any means. But uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, Alex, give us give us your plugs. Where can our listeners find you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at Dyslexic, D-Y-S, Alex I-C. I'm on Twitter at Polishi. It's just my last name, P-U-L-I-S-C-I. And um, I'm also on Letterboxd. You can follow along with movies I'm watching at Polishi. And, uh, Letterboxd, can... endorse us. Do it. And you guys could check out everything that's MDX Pods related at mdxpods.com, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at MDX Pods. If you want to follow along with what I've been watching on Letterboxd, I'm MDX Mike. And uh, yeah, Letterboxd, you know, you can endorse this or something. That'd be cool. And uh, be cool. yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.